about it. Okay, I think we're live. All right, we're live. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. This is uh, we're going to close out the day with a, a bit of a fun conversation. Um, if you saw our crucible fireside chat, we we started talking about the concepts of the open metaverse. Um, I'm Ryan, the co-founder and CEO of Crucible. Um, this is Nicholas from Ubisoft. He's the uh, blockchain initiative director at the Innovation Lab. This is Pierce from Delphi Digital. He's head, head of gaming. And then uh, my partner and, and uh, CTO, Toby. So, you know, the, the metaverse is a really big idea. Um, and prior to this year, it's really kind of primarily been a science fiction concept. But we're living through this pandemic and it's kind of you know, thrown everybody inside. And so now we're learning to live in these virtual environments a lot more. Uh, and that's sort of caused the forcing function for companies all over the world to try to figure out what that means. Um, we currently seem to be caught between two paradigms, right? Like business as usual, and then a new way of thinking about gaming. Um, are you seeing a big shift in the industry mindset? Uh, and why or why not? And how is that? How is that playing out? Nicholas, you can start. Um, <clears throat> so I agree that there is two paradigms here, but I'm not sure that it's, um, it's a huge shift, actually. I think it will take time. It will take, it will take time. And <clears throat> it's kind of um, a new market, a new, a new way to, to develop uh, the gaming industry, but it's, it will not replace the actual gaming industry. I don't think so. As mobile is not taking the place of uh, HD, uh, HD content uh, on console, it's run. No, not yet, at least. Uh, it takes time. Uh, so, so yes, for me, it's more, um, again, a new dimension that we have to explore. Um, people in the industry are not, always very open to it because they see it as something that will um, damage in a way the fun of, of, of games because if you add um, maybe I, I'm going a, a, a bit uh, <laughs> too too quickly here but uh, uh, it's if you if you begin to add economies in game as we can see in play to earn uh, in the play to earn uh, uh, Movement, I want to say, uh, it's a, uh, it's it. You might for, forgot why you are doing games, and you are not building games to create a new kind of labor. You are building games to help people to have fun, to 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 yeah, to to create some new kind of experience. And for the for the users, for the player, you you want to play. It's. Uh, it's entertainment. It's again. It's not work, and so it's, or at least it was. We were thinking like like that, for, since uh, the 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 old Greek actually, in antiquity. It's uh, the old times. Maybe it's changing. Maybe it's coming through the gaming industry, but it's more. Uh, a global movement uh, of the of the of the digital world, and that's why also that's what also is interesting in the metaverse is that it's not um, it's not just about gaming, of course, mm -hmm. uh, it's much more than that. And in a way, social media they are also in in a, in a metaverse, even if they don't call it like that. They just have a, a brick of it, and we at, in the gaming industry. We come with another break, but we will have occasion to to discuss that. I'm sure. So and you were to... you were a, a big driving force in Ubisoft to create this this blockchain initiative lab. Um, what are you guys uh, What are you guys defining success as uh, inside such a big company? How, how does that look over the next five years? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, in the next five years, of course, it would be to have a product working uh, <coughs> using blockchain. Of course, how it will use it. I think there is different ways. Uh, of course, NFT is a very interesting uh, uh, exploration, but uh, also uh, DAO. It's also something that I, I like a lot, and it could be very interesting to see how we can involve more and more our players in our experience. One of uh, Ubisoft motto is to say that we are trying to make players stakeholders of, of their experience, of our experience. So I think the DAOs are a very good way 
to 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 achieve that goal. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, in five years, having a game with NFC, NFT um, and maybe some kind of UGC managed by a DAO would be would be a great thing. That's a great leeway for for Pierce because where you sit, Pierce, you you work a lot with the primitives of Web three and how that intersects with gaming and esports. So if you could speak a little bit, number one, to what you do at, at Delphi and, and what the goal is there as head of gaming, and mm -hmm. also some of the things outside of Delphi with uh, MetaClan and some of the esports things you're doing. Sure. So yeah, at, at Delphi, uh, I'm really focused on helping build out our, our sort of gaming side, um, looking at uh, developing a sort of metaverse-focused research product which will track um, sort of key industry uh, progress across five sort of major, major verticals contributing to the metaverse's emergence. Um, the other aspect of it is uh, trying to sort of place Delphi on the map as the, the go-to consultancy shop for um, games uh, who are wondering how to sort of integrate these decentralized networks into either existing games or also designing new ones from the ground up and figuring out which roles they can play in the economy and where. Um, and then another project that I've been working on uh, as kind of a spin-off uh, of Meta Cartel. It's called MetaPlan, which is basically a crypto native esports organization, we're calling it. And uh, it's all managed through a DAO, right? Um, for those that don't know, a decentralized autonomous organization, whereby we basically give every single member, uh, they can buy in and actually own uh, a stake in the clan um, and vote on certain decisions. That might be the admission of new players, um, where to allocate resources for future quests. Um, and eventually, I actually would, would like to help it evolve into the competitive scene, whereby you'd have the clan sort of determining who's competing when and which rosters and so on. Um, so from the perspective of a research organization, how are you seeing the mindset of executives uh, in the gaming industry when this new Web3 thing is coming and, and becoming bigger? Sure. So I think on, on, on that side of the incumbent developers, it's super important to recognize that there are still some pretty strong disincentives uh, for some of these guys to implement these technologies. I mean, when you spend years refining these kind of transactional mechanics that revolve around user lock-in, platform-specific spend, and I'd even go as far as to say uh, sort of predatory psychological practices like we saw with the whole loot box. Yeah, terrible. Um, anyway, it's kind of very hard to rewire your thinking around some of this stuff. Um, beyond that, it's also super difficult to kind of figure out where these new business models can integrate. Um, as Nicholas said, I don't think they're going to replace anything. I think they're very much complementary to them and will build on top of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think there are also other problems around the kind of um, accountability to shareholders in certain instances uh, for, for big games companies because it can be kind of hard to wrap your head around the idea that actually surrendering elements of economic control to your player base can unlock these fundamentally new revenue streams which could actually in time become much larger than, than the sort of pre-existing ones. So yeah, I think it's a gradual process. I think it will take time. Um, I also think on the consumer side, like people... Um, are still, they have these deeply sort of ingrained transaction habits, right? I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't still a sucker for the occasional cool skin that pops up, whether it's in the Rainbow Six store or whatever. Um, I think the truth of the matter is that a lot of people still don't really know or care about these alternatives. Um, and I think it's really up to our industry, I suppose, to make something um, at scale that's such an awesome experience that not only does it kind of emphasize how crappy some of the you know business models around gaming were before, but that moving forwards, we don't really look back. Um, I mean, we kind of already see this in, in the blockchain gaming space where um, these kind of network effects are developing around certain pools of assets, right? Um, and due to the alignment that these players feel with the games, because they have real ownership in it, um, they make it their mission to try and sort of evangelize others. Um, and then on the developer side, we see them forming partnerships with other games. And, and where it gets really cool is when they start letting you use those assets in other games. And so we have this really cool, super positive kind of community cross-pollination, which actually serves to bolster both sides of the equation. Um, and those of you who do play games know that there's kind of a relatively sort of toxic uh, kind of tribalism around a lot of video games in the industry. And I definitely think this new, more expansive and collaborative and open-minded mindset will, will eventually permeate the whole industry. Yeah, it's really interesting to look at Epic if, if you're watching them closely. <clears throat> in a lot of ways, as the leader of the gaming industry, they're, they're taking the biggest risks. Um, and what they've proven is that this sort of cross-game, cross-platform thing can be good for business. Um, but what they are uh, kind of really feeling right now is that the way the gaming industry is built technically right now 
needs to be fixed before we can reach this promise of an open metaverse. So Toby, what infrastructure is missing exactly? Um, and how would you suggest that be done? And, and I know, you know, we're building a company around that, but you're also a lifetime gamer. So if you could speak as, as well as just a, a, a fan and a gamer. I'll take yeah, notes uh, on that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a few things. I mean, it touches on a few things that Piers just mentioned. Um, you know, that this idea of owning your own information, um, being somewhat alien to, to all of these silos. But it, really, it, it's about the player starting to be able to think about things in a different way. You know, at the moment, we're beholden to all of these platforms. You know, they own everything we do. And as much as we might uh, enjoy our collections of memes and photographs and what have you on Facebook and all these other platforms, we have very little control over them. I mean, even with the, the sort of data download things that people have been forced to implement, it doesn't do anything for us. And even if I download that data, where do I go now? You know, I've got to go to the next platform. I go from Twitter to Mastodon, find out there's nobody there and go back. You know, I'm put up with all of the trolls and the crap and other things in the meantime. When you expand this into the game world, you start to look at how much time people are, are spending there. And wh what Nicholas was saying earlier, it's not just gaming. You know, I've been in these worlds since it was text on a, on a, a modem. I, I, had to I had to work out how fast it was connecting by the sound it made, you know? So I, I've been doing this since everything was imagination back then. And the only thing that mattered in the hacker world, at least, was what you'd said and what you did. So it's all about how you represent yourself, how you behave. And it's not just about playing a game about entertainment and about escape. It's about connections. You know, we, we are able to make connections with people in different ways online. And this is something that I've struggled to get across to a lot of people. And I think a lot of people are starting to be forcibly introduced to it now because now we're having to go to school, go to work, do everything online. And it seems to a lot of people counterintuitive. You sit with the computer between you and this other person and you've got a flat screen to look at and it all seems very, very odd. But when it's done the right way, when you're playing a, a game alongside somebody, even, even when it's a 2D screen, even when it's text, especially when you go further into VR and you've got presence, you've got gestural representation, facial representation, phonemes, making people's mouths move the correct way, there is a level of human connection you can achieve via the machine that people really don't understand until they experience it. And the emotes and the skins and these sorts of things that are happening in Fortnite and Roblox and these kinds of places, they're starting to, to get this across to the adults. The kids get it. You know, the, the kids, it, it's just that's what they've got. That's what they do, and it works. It was the same for me. I'm, I'm not the guy that builds all the worlds. I'm not the guy that, you know, creates all the things. I'm a hacker and a storyteller and a troublemaker. I'm here to mess things up and bang things together. So to me, what's missing is that glue in the middle. It's not just the plumbing, the stuff that nobody else wants to make, but it's all <laughs> hello, but it's also it's having it done in a way that keeps people in the middle. You know, everything at the moment is profit centric. And to a degree it must be. You know, there was a great conversation earlier where um I think Lawrence was asking some provocative questions about you know, we're saying well, we wouldn't be where we are now if it wasn't for surveillance capitalism. And to a degree, that's true. Now, I would argue that there have always been better ways to do it. But the way it has been done has still gotten us to a point where I can now reach out to a nuclear physicist on the Internet and ask him dumb questions and he'll answer me. You know, and I can meet people like Nicholas and Piers. I don't like talking to people. I don't go outside. I try not to meet people. I mean, that's why I have Ryan, you know. But... I can meet these people, I can speak to them, I, I'm, I'm autistic, I, I can use these tools to communicate in ways that I can't normally manage. And these are things that are starting to be understood by people other than hackers and nerds and, and anarchists. You know, and, and I think it's, it's the desire to both to build these interstitial spaces in between, but also the desire to build them for people. For people first, for people to be able to be who they are, to control who they are, and to be able to make a genuine connection. And for people to be able to make money out of that. You know, if you can do it that way, that's that's your black mirror, white mirror divide. You know, this is the thing that, that Ryan and I talk about a lot. I want 
the future that you see in Black Mirror and in all of the cyberpunk dystopias. I want the shiny, I want all the things, I want all the connectivity. I don't want the dystopia, I don't want people in my brain. So the difference, the, the thing that is needed to get us to that white mirror instead of black mirror is that foundational layer of protecting me, protecting my information, letting me choose what hits my eyeballs. When we get that right, that will fix it. But to what Piers said, it's up to us to build something that shows people how that can work. Not just showing the users how it can work and be easy and be fun, but show the businesses how they can still reach out and make direct contacts and make better contacts, do better advertising without trading in people's lives. Well, you have us all fooled that you don't like talking, but at least you say good things. Um, That's because you're, you're all safely at a distance. So I, I'd like to dial in a little bit more on the business and the profit, because in order for this to become viable, it, it has to be good business, right? Um, we do want this to be a white mirror, but gaming did 10 billion dollars in march so to see that a, a a metaverse can be a multi-trillion dollar event is is really not that hard to believe um i've spoken to almost everyone in the industry and i believe that most people are all aligned that the player is the most important piece of this right so working backwards from the player what kind of world do you think exists when this is a reality because nicholas i know that you talk a lot about uh, your initiatives as empowering the player because you know once the player is empowered it's a much stronger and richer experience for them so project that into the future a little bit what might that look like hey that's a tough question um, <clears throat> so first I think if we go backwards as you said we could we have to imagine what kind of tools we, we give to the to the players um how they can they can create things and how these things can be related to the to the to reality um in the um, actually i think uh it's not uh it's not black mirror but uh, there is another uh, uh good future uh, or a projection of a good future it's a magic leap uh uh, advertising, you know, <laughs> there is a, it's a, I don't know if they will deliver it, but it's, it's very interesting to, to see how they think that we could, uh, yeah, we could add this kind of virtual, uh, assets in the real world. And if we go that way, for instance, we, we have to, to imagine a world where the real space is a bit more empty or there is less uh, material uh, real thing material things physical things and a lot more um occasion to 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 personalize its own environment again it has two i think two 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 side two side the two sides the first one is uh, maybe the white mirror it's uh, it can allow us to become all creators of our own world. If we can share it, it can be very interesting. But as on actual, on current social media, there is a, a black side, a dark side. Uh, and this dark side is that we all live in our old, uh, own bubble, uh, in our own reality. And actually, and maybe it's my philosophical background that is speaking here, but I think that reality is something that is shared. And it's not something that we own on just on our side. So uh, this future, it's a future where we can all add the, um, the power on our information, as um, to be said, but also the power to create what, what we want to create, to express ourselves. And we can see it a bit in, the, in the, the skin in Fortnite, for instance. There is this kind of narcissism that made people really want to show what they are, but they can do it only with what Epic is, is offering us, uh, them. So we we have to allow one, yeah, again, this future might be a future where people can really show what they want to show. And as W was saying, um, when he was a, I don't know, maybe he's still a troublemaker, but <laughs> when he's a troublemaker on, the, on some kind of uh, pre, pre dark net, <laughs> it was not the dark net yet. <laughs> Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, 
we were able to show us uh, as we want, as we wanted. We were, when it was just text, and I was not a hacker, but I, I had a lot of discussion, especially with girls, <laughs> <laughs> with text. <laughs> I'm sure uh, I show what I thought at the time, the better uh, side of myself. And maybe we have to offer this kind of, of uh, proposition to the players to build their the, the world they want to share. And sorry, I, I didn't answer at all on the business side, but it's uh, it's easier for me to, <laughs> to go that way. Yeah, Pierce, we've been jamming a lot on this lately. I know you're just as passionate as Toby and I. Um, so what does it look like? Paint me the picture of what, what a potential open metaverse can look like. So yeah, I, th I think I'd preface it by kind of echoing a bit what Toby and, and Nicholas have touched on and that um, I think kind of the primary design consideration has to be the preservation of the human component of the social component. We've already seen that abused in the context of the internet and we need to make better choices, right, in a, in a better and more open and transparent way than in the way that the web evolves. Um, I think fundamentally, like this idea of the metaverse kind of represents the next great milestone as, as on our journey as, as, a net, as a network species, right? Um, and I suspect that it actually will actually have a much larger impact than many people uh, might think. I mean, you know, our dominant interaction models, the way we live and work and so on, these are all subject to change. Um, I think it was Naval Harari who wrote in Homo Deus a couple of years back that we've seen this massive contraction um, in kind of evolutionary checkpoints, right? The hunter-gatherer age lasted several million years, the agricultural age, several thousand, uh, the, in, the industrial age was several hundred, and then we had the information age, which has been, you know, a handful of decades. And what we're kind of looking out upon is loosely defined or called, um, you know, the augmented age. Um, and each of these checkpoints is kind of driven by efficiency improvements at increasingly large scales. Um, and I think our ability to kind of transact information seem to have entered warp speed with the information age, but I don't think that we've actually um, really scratched the surface. We have fundamentally low bandwidth ways of interacting with the digital realm still. You know, most people read between the three or 400 words a minute, and yet most people type at around 40. And actually, Elon Musk uh, pointed out that um, with the advent of mobile, we actually dropped from using 10 fingers down to two thumbs, which is in some ways a step backwards. But we're gravitating towards this world in which all the digital communication <clears throat> has a super high information density through the subtleties of voice, facial expressions, and body language that not only others uh, can understand, but so do the computers, right? That are all part of this. Um, so I, I don't, I think people shouldn't be too quick to kind of underestimate the role of NLP and computer vision in the context of the metaverse too. I think the increased kind of interactivity between man and machine will play a massive role in how we create and collaborate uh, at scale in this new environment. Um, as I say, the augmented age is kind of upon us, but we don't really know where it takes us. Um, what is kind of clear uh, is that by introducing the, the third dimension, I suppose, the web, we're going to radi radically expand its volume uh, in ways that are kind of difficult to predict right now. Um, so much of the last 10 or 20 years has been about humans projecting themselves into the internet, right? Their fears, interests, social groups, <clears throat> you know, as Nicholas was just saying, you know, you want to portray your best self or whatever uh, through skins and so on. But we're on the, cu we're on the cusp of introducing this sense of... Um, physical embodiment, right, by actually projecting our minds into the metaverse. And Nicholas, you'll, you'll be uh, well versed in this, but it does kind of get pretty philosophical pretty quickly when we consider what and where individual beings really are as we begin to kind of jump between these different planes of existence. So yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think we'll see pretty radical changes to how people perceive the web in general. Um, one of the most exciting aspects of it, as we touched upon, is how much it will empower the individual. Uh, you know, users are going to be able to create uh, unimaginable content with super powerful tools and monetize it through gro global marketplaces where, you know, most things are both produced uh, and consumed digitally. Um, we're seeing major advancements in the tool sets for like, you know, hobbyist creators already. You look at the rise of platforms like Minecraft and Roblox. These are really rudimentary forms of the same thing. Obviously, we've got Unreal Engine 5 coming out soon, which is super exciting for, for how that enables developers. But again, like Epic stand by that their objective of all of this stuff is to um, empower the creators, even through Fortnite creative mode, to build anything that Epic themselves can. Um, and I think that's super exciting. That's where we're heading. Um, the early signs of it, I'd say, one of the really tangible ones is art in the NFT space. It's absolutely insane, the explosion of activity around that. I mean, we had relatively recently ERC-721s, you know, over to ERC-20 contracts. That wasn't just for a momentary blip, that's persisted. Um, so yeah, it's really cool to see the direction we're going. I think it's just this more global, more participatory um, economy. Um, 
and yeah, it all stems from creation, really. I just yeah, like so, to add a bit on to that, yeah, if you so don't mind, Ryan. Yeah. Something that you mentioned, Piers, is really key to, to what we're trying to do. The idea of NLP, AI, all of these sorts of things being able to start to interpret what we're doing as, as our input to the computer gets better with eye tracking, gestural tracking, the ability for the computer to register my, my phonemes regardless of my language. We're not just talking about making better connections. We're talking about enabling this sort of thing for everybody. You know, from, you know, uh, avatar creators that can allow you to create trans characters to uh, accessibility for, for blind and, and uh, hearing impaired people. If the computer can start to understand these things, then it can start to translate my wave into Braille. You know, so now all of a sudden it doesn't matter what the medium is. Everybody can participate the same way. And that's as important metaphysically and emotionally as it is financially. And I think that's a really key part to what you were just saying. And that leads how I wanted to close it is, <clears throat> Toby, you and I have talked a lot with Outlier Ventures about how the convergence stack is really a substrate for the metaverse. So it's much bigger than just gaming. So if you want to just kind of speak to Web3 in a more general sense, when we talk about the future of, of work and the future of how we organize as, as people, as a society, how does that fit into the, the concept of the metaverse? Yeah, well, it's funny. I mean, that, that's kind of how we came across Outlier in the first place is this word convergence, because I was preaching for years that the metaverse uh, or even just VR, you know, it's, it's not one technology. It's not one thing that's got to hit maturity. It is literally a convergence of maybe 16 different entire streams of technology that all have to come together. It's like one of those archways that won't hold itself up until you put the keystone in. Every piece has to be in place. So we're in the infancy of most of these things and it's, it's blockchain, it's AI, it's robotics, it's neurophysics, it's all sorts of stuff. And all of these things have to come together, but humanities as well. You know, starting to teach the computer to understand people, to understand cultural re relationships, to have moderation systems that allow for local and regional laws and cultural mores. You know, to start to make these systems weighted around the people. And the Web3 side of things, you know, we've gotten, in several areas, it's gotten a bad name. You know, the whole ICO boom and the enormous number of, of, of tricksters and, well, put it fashionably, uh, charitably, I should say, have given it a bad name. And they've, they, that's rubbed off on the technology. And, and it's like many other technologies, you know, people have taken the blockchain and, and use it as a hammer to, to be everything. And at the end of the day, blockchain's, just another database. You know, I'm going to get lynched for that after this. But, uh, you know, I, I remember when I started learning about blockchain, I thought I was going nuts for a quite like over a year because I could not see what everybody else was seeing in all of these crypto systems. And it's because it, it, it's emperor's children, uh, sorry, emperor's clothing. You know, the emperor has no clothes. Most of these systems are valueless. They only exist to speculate. And the vast majority of the functionality that's going to come out in DAOs and, and these, these broad metaphysical uh, uh, meta, metaverse systems, they're going to come on stable coins. They're going to come on tokens that use the utility but are not there for speculative gain. And, and I think the key is just to remember that all of these technologies, as amazing as they are and as brilliant as they are, they're all still in their infancy. And in particular, the convergence of these things is in its infancy. And it's up to us to bang them together, to come together and reach out across our silos and make sure that everybody's talking to everybody else, not to make everybody do the same thing, but to ask each other the questions, you know, to push the ethics, to push who's being left behind, to see is this a good idea, is it worthwhile, is it actually creating value, not money for somebody, because the world's doing that already. It's putting billions of dollars in the pockets of the word I probably shouldn't say on a panel, but you know what we want is to create something new. Tim Berners Lee he despairs of what's happened to the web, and he's trying to do something new. So are we. So let's do it better this time. Let's get everybody together, be different, be arguing, be competing, but make these things together. Make them all happen at once, and put the tools out there in the hands of everybody to see what emerges. All right. Well, we got thirty seconds left, so. Thank you, everybody. Looks like, I don't know if it's 1,215 1, people here or registered, but whoever's here, thank you for being here with us. Um, and I put our email uh, in the chat if you'd like to track with us. We're going to be doing a lot more of this. So.
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nicholas. Guys. You want to you want to tell us something cool about the new uh, Assassin's Creed to yeah. send Valhalla. us out? Be a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, Ragnar's the protagonist. Ragnar's oh. the name of my dog. Really nice. Yeah. So it's not. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> Toby. Toby is the the, the main character. Toby oh, is I the main character. Yes, I have I have the beard. Yeah. All right, thank well, you, everybody. everybody. That's been brilliant. Bye. Cheers. Thanks a lot, guys.